Okay. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. Hi, I am Krista Porter. Can you hear on the end? <laughs> um, here at the Library Commission. I am the host of Encompass Live. Um, I haven't it's been a couple weeks since I've done the show because I've been out traveling, so I'm trying to get back in the swing of things. <laughs> um, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We are a webinar. Um, we broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but our shows are all recorded, so if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can just um, head over to our website, which I will show you um, later at the end of today's show, possibly during this show, depends on the questions, <laughs> um, and show you where all of our archives are. Um, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So um, please do share with your friends, neighbors, family, colleagues, anyone who you think might be interested in any of our topics. Send them to our website. They can sign up for the live shows. And they can watch all of our archives that are on there. Um, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, um, book reviews, interviews, um, mini training sessions, demos of services and products. Basically, anything library related is um, good for the show. Um, that's my only criteria. It's something that libraries are doing, something that they could be doing, um, services that we provide to the commission that we think would be of use to libraries, um, interesting things that libraries out there around Nebraska and outside of Nebraska are doing. Um, we do bring on guest speakers sometimes to the show from outside of the commission and outside of the state, um, but sometimes we have commission staff do presentations, and that's what we have today, a whole mob of commission people. <laughs> mom, I <guess>. mom. <laughs> um, and I think what we'll do is we'll just have we'll just do a quick everyone just introduce themselves, short name and title, um, and um, we have one other person joining us in a little bit, and then um, we'll get into um, what we're doing. So I'm Chris Porter, as you know, host of the show, and uh, Library Development Director here at the Library Commission. I'm Mary Jo Ryan. I'm the Communications Coordinator here at the Library Commission. Hi, I'm Rod Wagner, Director of Library Commission. Joanne McManus, uh, Project Manager for the Library Innovation Studio Project. Uh, Susan Misley, uh, online services librarian in the technology and access services uh, department. Sam Shaw, planning and data services coordinator. So we have quite a crowd. Yeah. Good. It's that, that's good because we have a lot of questions to answer. And so we need a lot of people to help make those questions happen. Um, if I could, Krista, I'll just kind of describe uh, what's up at the commission, this particular show that we're doing today. Um, we actually did a show like this when we, it was the uh, a session at the NLA and SLA conference. Um, we, we thought it would be fun to just have ask people what their questions were about the Library Commission. And so we do have quite a stack of questions that people were, asked, uh, were asking about the Library Commission. Um, but also, we want to ask you, that those of you that are on the show net right now, to please put your questions into the chat box. Uh, Krista will be watching the chat box, yep. and she'll interrupt us with your questions, so your questions get top priority. So if you have questions that we can answer about the Library Commission or about the services of the Library Commission, we would really appreciate it if you would just go ahead and type them in the chat box now or any time during the show. So, is everybody ready? We are ready. <laughs> we decided to do this sort of like backyard farmer uh, TV show, and so um, if if uh, somebody lapses into suggesting that you try some 2,4-D on your lawn, <laughs> you'll know that it was just an accident. Go right back to libraries. It might be a good answer, though. It might be a good answer. So I don't know who wants this question, but here it is: Should I use interlibrary loan or book club kits for multiple copy requests? Who wants that question? Susan wants it. Go, girl. I'll answer, and Lisa can uh, uh, send a message if I answer wrong. Um, I think the Library Commission usually tries to uh, fill those first with book club kits if they can. Um, people can certainly browse through and look. They've got uh, information on other book club kits on their website. So that seems a good way that people can pick books for your book club. So that, I think, is the uh, Preferred method of the book request matches content of our kit. Um, otherwise, they do go and look for uh, copies of other libraries around the country. That's a little bit more tedious in terms of uh, coordinating 
I can imagine. You have to go through an library loan to do it in multiple times, probably. Yeah, if you need 10, you need 10 <laughs> library loan requests. Yeah. Book club kits are way more convenient. So, um, do, as long as we talk about book clubs, um, we do have a lot of titles for book club kits. I know they just added a bunch of new titles. Can we go ahead and go to the, you have the, oh, no. I'm going to go ahead and go to the website here and say, I don't want to spell that copy. <laughs> okay, book, book club kits from the Nebraska Library Commission. And so you can see that you can ask for if you know exactly what you want, or you can browse the entire collection, or you can browse Nebraska related books, or browse Nebraska 150 books, so all fiction books. So it's fairly easy to, let's just look at this app, what it looks like when you browse fiction books. And there they are. They've got the, the cover, and they've got links to discussion questions. So this is pretty handy. I think um, there's 1,263 titles that have three or more copies. Wow. Um, and there's young adult, graphic novels, all kinds of, of book club kits. And, and I think Lisa might be um, on the show remotely. Yes, so she's in the laptop room. Lisa, if you have anything you want to add, please type it into the chat box and we'll get that information in. Okay, here we go. Can I just ask one thing about the book club kids? Oh, sure, Sam. Um, is the service free? It is free. And that is a good thing to say. <laughs> and, it, and, and, you know, just to remind you, it goes always through a librarian, a school librarian or a uh, academic or a public uh, librarian. Lisa says. Yes, it's free, but of course, and this is, you would have to pay postage to return them to us. There's no cost for us to get them to you or for using the books, of course, but whatever it costs you to get it back to us in postage, um, right. you, would, you would pay that. There's no like prepaid boxes or things that we have. Good. Yeah. And, and again, if you, uh, if you talk to somebody who has a book club, have them order it through the library, not contact us directly. And there are also book club kits available, and I only know this because you were just asking about it, through our regional library systems. Yeah. So um, our regional library system offices, the four systems that we have, if they are more um, like um, convenient for you to get to them, to pick them up, or to just drop them off, to return them. If you, you know, you might be able to go through them. They have different ones and fewer that we have, but um, they are also um, another resource for that. Right. Please keep the microphone down a little bit more that way to make it more centered for is everybody. The other yeah, and, yeah, and please uh, type, type in the chat box if you're having any trouble hearing us. Because we have quite a large group, larger than we usually have. Okay, I have a question here from somebody who says, I'm new to the Nebraska library community. I just started at a library. Do you have any good suggestions for getting to know the library community or the library commission's resources? Any suggestions? And this could be for anybody on the panel. <coughs> Well, when we were at conference, that was kind of a no-brainer. It was attend the conferences and meetings and events that are going on. Um, and I think that's good no matter what. Yeah. I think, you know, think about what kinds of trainings coming up in your area, mm -hmm. what kind of... The conference has cost, of course, but a lot of the workshops and trainings um, are free. So mm -hmm. it's only your time and um, whatever teachers you get there. Um, there are also some... Um, Groups like the castle, the groups of libraries of different types, and some of the different systems get together and have regular meetings. So, um, actually, look at your once again, it's like what's a lesson. The regional library systems web pages. Um, it's actually there in the pull down menu. Well, they have the camera. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, if um, each of our systems has their I know a website of their own. Um, that, that you can go to and see what's on their calendar of trainings they're doing, workshops, just meetings. Um, so you can click right here. Mm -hmm. oh, and uh, there we go. And you'll yes. go to their website. This is Western Library System. Mm -hmm. And um, find out what's going on. For example, an overdrive workshop, an e workshop, you know, a variety of things like that. 
And they do have, I'm not sure, I didn't notice at the very top of the menu on the right, it does have a calendar. Let's see if they have down other pages. You know, it's all across the top too. So there again, we go. So there's a calendar version of it, yeah. So uh, here's a suggestion from Beth Fella from um, Lead Imperial Public Library. She says, um, invite people to come to your library or offer to host a workshop. That's a good idea. Excellent idea. You know, reach out to your system mm -hmm. or to us and say, hey, we'd like to have something mm -hmm. here. Um, we've got space, we've got a meeting room, um, and then they'll come to you. And of course, we want you to watch Encompass Live on Wednesday morning, so you'll catch up and stay up. Anybody else have anything else they'd like to add that would be good for someone who's new? Uh, there are a couple of new resources available on the Library Commission's website for new library directors uh, mm -hmm. and library trustees that uh, is a good source for people uh, new to uh, public libraries. Anyway. Um, maybe I've got like director's handbook. Director's handbook. I'm just going to see what happens if I do new library director. But we don't call it that. I know. Because it's, I just thought maybe it would come up. Yeah, it's, it's come up. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not used to this keyboard, so I'm having a little trouble. Oh, I think that's it right there, huh? Let me so go. library director's guidebook. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a director, I mean, even if you're not a director, there's a lot of good stuff here that, that you can learn about. Funding, accreditation, events. And then Rod also mentioned something for the trustees. Yeah, I'm having a little trouble with this keyboard, aren't I? Let me try again. Let's see what's going on. <laughs> it's not oh, my, 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 my. Wireless. Yeah. All right. Okay. So over here under our accreditation and certification sections, we have links about boards being certified, librarians being certified. And libraries, and this is where you have a link to the director's guidebook that we already right. saw, yeah. and the library board manual. Okay, there we go, library board yeah. manual. And here you see. But if you had a keyboard that wasn't wireless, <laughs> you could do it. You could do what I was trying to do. Much better. <laughs> All right. And we did one other comment that came in about the book club kits that I wanted to mention. I didn't know this, and I thought, and I know I've had discussions about it. In addition to um, the search for the, the book club kits. It actually includes um, other libraries that also have book club kits they're willing to share, like Wood Ridge West Point. So we've actually oh, gathered wow. into that database, uh -huh. not just these ones that we have. So you may have end up with someone local to you that is who you would end up buying that from. Right. Now that's a great idea. Okay, well I've got one for you, Kristen. I am having trouble with my basic skills class. I can't make Moodle do what I want it to do. Yeah, I know. Well, it can. Yeah. <laughs> That's very That's nice. I know, I know. I don't it's kill the messenger. I'm just saying. What do you suggest people do if they are taking a basic skills class and have trouble with Moodle? Um, basic skills, that is run by um, Holly Duggan, who is the C continuing, edu continuing Education Coordinator here. Um, and she is in charge of that. We have a lot of resources on the website. Um, there she is in the middle of our. There we are. Yeah. Holly Duggan. Uh, like Holly yeah, Duggan. she's our. She um, would be your first line of defense for that. Um, well, it depends what your problem is actually. If you're in the middle of a current class, you have an instructor. Whoever your instructor is, reach out to them first. Um, they it may be just something that is going wonky in their particular class. They forgot to update a link. <laughs> um, something was broken since they set up the class. You never know what things can happen with technology. So your instructor, whoever class you're currently taking, would be the first one to talk to. Um, if they can't figure it out, they may go to Holly for you, um, or you could also contact yourself. It's more if it's more of a, um, I don't know what my password is, or I've lost my password. That kind of contact, you know, basically getting into it. 
Um, but navigating your course, if, if that's something that you're unsure about, um, we, everyone who teaches it, we, um, well, we have to know it as well. So we can probably give you tips about where you should be clicking um, if something is changed, because it does get updated, the interface and the back end part of it. So um, reach out to your current instructor, and if that's not helping, um, Holly is our main person in charge of all that. Very good. Yeah, I had a question here, uh, and actually I got this one at the uh, booth, the Library Commission booth. So I had, they wrote it down on the card at the booth. We had cards at the booth, we had cards all over there at the conference. And this one says, can I customize the handouts for Nebraska Access for Overdrive? That would be useful. Um, you sure can. Uh, we usually uh, oftentimes put them up in PDF format, but if they're handouts that we created, um, oftentimes the ones that I've created, I create in uh, Microsoft Word, so I can find the Word version, the original Word version, before I converted it to PDF, and I've sent that. I've sent those handouts. Uh, versions to people before too, so they can. Uh, just remember, so you can show where those are. Um, or if you want the mouse, you can do it. Well, the Nebraska Access Handouts. Uh, okay. There's that question mark after each uh, database logo, and so they'll usually find those. They'll often find those there. And so, like for uh, if I go to the the list. Okay, so just so now you can go to uh, go down to the third heading, uh, and there's a novel list, a handout under for more help at the top created by us. Uh, those are created by us, and then the ones down below help resources for us go off and in there. Yes, so that's an example of something where I've got it in one format on my uh, computer, so I can always send that to you. And there's also, uh, I know one, one thing people asked for was uh, videos, and there are videos like on how to use a lot of these data databases right on the website. Now, I don't know if this is one of them where there is one. They actually have a whole YouTube channel devoted to uh, novel lists. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's listed there. Yeah. They've got multiple uh, short videos on different types of search and computing. Two minute tours, it says. That's great. That's perfect. It's going to vary, vary from database to database. Correct. Some, some you'll have a, an overabundance, and others will be uh, less than you would like, probably. It really does vary. Now, is there, is there also somewhere for promoting this? You have to like, add your library's address here, like in a blank space? Um, we have. I wish I could type in here. It's, it's in the toolkit, right? Yeah, the, if you type in uh, librarian's toolkit. See, the problem is it isn't letting me type. Um, I, mean, it, I try, it, it, it fails to get everything I'm putting in here. That should be toolkit should be enough. Just, just click on the search. There, you go. there, there, there it is. Toolbox. 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 Ah, got it. Okay. Wow. So here we've got in the toolbox. We've got a variety of promotional materials. Some of which you can just fill in the blank. Right. So we can call those handouts. You can just fill in the blanks. And print your own. It's got your own information with your own password, your own library uh, name, your school, whatever. And, and then the business, business card is the yeah. same thing. Pass, password, business card, your own password. So this is pretty useful for folks. So here's a question. This is a pretty general question, but, I, but you can maybe expand upon it, Joanne. How can we get the makerspace to our library? <laughs> That's a pretty general question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that is general, but it's a, uh, it's a, there's an answer. Um, we have selected the first 17 libraries to get the makerspace, and we will still be selecting 13. We'll have a application process that will have a deadline sometime in May. 
Um, we don't have an exact date, but we're looking at May. On our website, if you look under grants, and then it'll go across to Library Innovation Studio Project, we still have all of the information and application information for the first round. So, for instance, if you want to know what that application looks like, just click on either the PDF or Word file for that application of interest and commitment. Uh, so, obviously, the deadlines will be different in there, but that will be the application that we'll be using. And there's also uh, the right above that library participation benefits and expectations and answers to questions. That's a good document to read uh, to get more information about what would be expected of a library, what the benefits are, mm -hmm. and um, I don't think there's too many. I haven't updated that, but there won't be too many changes to that as, as well. The that's of course. Those that were at conference, you probably saw the studio equipment. There's certainly a lot of it. Um, we delivered the first equipment last week to the Plasma Public Library. And this week, we're in Ainsworth, Nebraska, installing and training on their equipment. And uh, so when these um, these studios are in your area, go check them out and see what they're, what's all involved. Or take a look at this, because these what this website has pretty detailed information about each piece of equipment. Like this is the Carby Inventable CNC router, and it's got some information about it. It shows you what it looks like. It's got its dimensions and the fact that it has a computer attached to it. it shows what it can do and a video. So there's, there's quite a lot of information about each piece of, the, of the equipment if people want to take a look and see just what we're talking about with this makerspace. Right. Plan. And it's pretty exciting. Those libraries that don't think that they have room for all of this equipment because um, it is a lot of equipment. Uh, we can also do mini studios. Uh, Crete and Loop, Loop City are an example of mini studios that we'll be installing in a few weeks. And and what they're doing is rather than having all of the equipment for a total of 20 weeks, they each will split up that kit, each will get half of the equipment for 10 weeks, and then we'll swap it and then get the other half for the other 10 weeks. So if you don't have quite enough space, that's what we do. And of course, you don't have to have all the space in one area, for instance, for a big meeting room or something, we can put the CNC router in that corner, the laser cutter in another corner, and so it can be scattered uh, across your library if that's the only way it'll work for you. Let me just uh, show you just real quickly the community engagement page. One piece of, of this project, which is makes this more than just a makerspace, is the expectation of community engagement activities. And Basically, it's, it's a simple way for the community to get very involved in the library, for the library to get very involved in the community. And part of it is forming a community action team. Another section is forming a training team, planning events, and planning a, a longer term activity schedule of trying to get support for the community, or from the community, for the makerspace in the library. So there's, we've got resources here about community engagement as well, because that's another expectation of the makerspace grant. Mm -hmm. And kind of a, I, I think this is helpful. It's kind of a timeline of what goes on. This is the week, if this were the week that, you're, that your makerspace is installed, and then you have it for 22 weeks here, and these are the kinds of things you're doing during that 22 weeks, and then these are the kinds of things you're doing before that. She did. I mean, uh, it is. Dave and uh, uh, Valentine, who's one of our partners at the university, put together a milestones chart and then she did that uh, timeline for us from that. So we're very fortunate to have Tessa. I like that kind of visuals. Yeah. It, it makes, doesn't it that help? help? Dates out. I know. <laughs> to me, it really helps just to see that visual. Okay, so I've got a good one here. I can't remember the Nebraska Access Password. How can I make this easier so I don't have to keep re-entering it? Um, what do you think, Susan? Well, if, uh, if, you're, if you're entering it all the time, it probably means you don't have IP access, so telling you that you can set up IP access is probably not helpful. Um, sometimes uh, you can have uh, the 
depending on your web browser, you can have your web browser remember a password. There's certainly nothing wrong with um, putting a little sticker with the password on computers in the library. That's certainly acceptable. So, but way, you will have to change that. You have to change it. <laughs> Twice a year, like they you get reissued. Yeah, so. you don't want to adhere it too, uh, <laughs> too strongly to your computer desktop. Or, but, but yeah, you, you can certainly put a little card up or something. Mm -hmm. And those password cards, those business cards, mm -hmm. password business cards are good because you can give them to people as right. well as have them around. Like Make one right. of those up and tape it to your, to your computer for the group until the next one comes out. Yeah. And then the other uh, the other uh, workaround is you've got your, uh, your driver's license. You can always pull out your uh, driver's license and type in your driver's license number. So that's oh, yeah, that's nice. perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Any, that's awesome. yeah. Any citizen in the state can just use their driver's license number to get in. They don't need to even go to the library and get a password that's specific. Right. Because officially, Nebraska Access is purchased for use of all Nebraska citizens. Pretty much. That's it, yeah. So we do have a little um, type in, I assume this is Lisa typing this. Uh, um, she would actually respond to the first part of the question, oh, just like, I need my Nebraska Access password. Yeah. And she says, call our 800 number. Call our 800 number. You just yeah. can't even remember and you don't know what it is. Call our 800 number, 800 307 2665. And then we can we can look that up and give it out to you as well, too. Yeah, right here about yeah. us, you can find our 800 number. Okay, Rod, there's two questions here that I got from two different people. Uh oh. I know, and, and they are basically around, the, if I tell you the first one, it's about the same as the second one. How are the budgets going to play out in the commission? This one says, I can't have trouble reading it, it's, uh, what is, what are the budget cuts in the commission? So there you go. Okay, well this goes back to the um, legislative session from uh, earlier this year. The uh, state tax revenues, as has been the case for a number of, uh, actually for a long while, state tax revenues have fallen below projections. And so the uh, legislature and governor uh, enacted a state budget for the current biennium that began July 1, 2017, uh, that reduced uh, many uh, budgets for state agencies, state programs and services. The Library Commission state funds uh, budget for its operations program was reduced by 8% about. Um, the Library Commission's state aid to libraries program, which includes our grants and contracts, database licensing, uh, regional library system funding, state aid to libraries and, and other things um, actually was not reduced. It was left at last fiscal year's funding level. Uh, so that's uh, the uh, current uh, biennium budget. It's a two-year budget uh, going through June of 2019. Um, the update though is that uh, state tax revenues have continued to fall below projections and the state's economic uh, forecasting board last month when they met uh, lowered their uh, projections again. And so the uh, governor and legislature, when the legislature reconvenes in January, they will again be looking at uh, resolving this uh, reduced revenue um, situation. And that likely will lead to further state budget cuts of some amount. On the federal side, uh, there's been lots of concern about what will happen to federal library program funding. Um, there's been some uh, good news in that the uh, House, the U.S. Congress, the House of Representatives, passed uh, appropriations bills that included Federal Library Program funding, that is the funds for the Institute of Museum and Library Services and uh, Library Services and Technology Act. Those funds were um, left at the last fiscal year funding level. The Senate has yet to act on the federal budget, um, but their uh, earlier 
uh, funding levels that came out of their uh, appropriations committee actually had a slight increase for LST funding. So uh, they're expected to uh, uh, pass uh, legislation before the end of December. Uh, and then there would have to be resolution with the House um, appropriations amount. So the federal funds uh, prospects are, are good at this point. Remember, though, that we're already a couple of months into the new federal fiscal year and appropriations have not been made for the full year. So that is yet to be resolved. That's where we are right now. It's a, a bit of a wait and see. Always wait and see on the federal side. Yes. So I have a kind of a timely one for you, Sam. This is a person who says they're having trouble submitting their biliostat profile. The public library survey? Yeah, I guess so. That's so the, um, the public, every year between mid-November mid to mid-February, we collect um, data as a part of the public library survey. So maybe if you could go on our website over to the um, the stat page. Okay, where is it? Um, if you type it in, well, for searches. I know, it's really, I know. <laughs> and so there, there, there there is. The, the survey is actually the, the IMLS public library survey. We use a tool called Bibliostat to collect the data. So it's Bibliostat um, collect. There yeah, so, so on there this is. page here, um, you'll see a, a link to the login screen. And your username and password is the same as your accreditation application. But if you do need that, um, either contact me or the reference desk as well. Um, they would be able to get that um, username and password to you. Um, you see a lot, a lot of other tools on this page. Uh, blank copy of the survey. Sometimes it's helpful to, to print that out and then fill it out before you actually enter the data online. Oh yeah. Um, but some of the data is already pre-filled. Correct. We try and pre-fill as much of the data as we can. Um, some of it um, is kind of doesn't vary from year to year. Um, address, phone numbers, things like that. We also pre-fill the overdrive data. If you're a member of the consortium, we'll pre-fill the holdings and your circulations for overdrive. Now, if you do have an advantage account, um, you'll need to, to enter that information in the holding section. Um, the circulation data includes all of your overdrive. So that would include your advantage titles as well as as well as what's in the consortium. Um, if you do want to know um, what changes we've made, there's also a link, uh, it's the third one from the top there, Mary Jo, um, that has the changes highlighted from year to year. Um, the good news is this year there weren't very many changes. So, so if you're familiar with it um, from last year, um, there weren't very many changes this year. Also, I want to point out one more thing finally. Um, the second link from the bottom there, there's a, a guide for new directors. So if you're new, um, this kind of takes you through the process of, of why we do this and how we do it. Um, and also has a, a guide to how to use Biblostat as well, if you're not familiar with that. And if you do have any questions, feel free to contact me. I'm available to help you with the survey. Um, like I said, it just started, um, yeah. so it's now available, and it runs um, until the middle of February. Very convenient timing, because it yeah. opened up two days ago. And the other, and the other yeah. question that had to do with the survey was how, how are the peers uh, selected? Uh, peer libraries? Peer libraries. Accreditation? Yes. Okay, so, so generally on the accreditation application, if you're up for accreditation, um, there'll be a list of, there's, there's a link, I think, on the right-hand side of that page once you log in. That mm -hmm. says view peer libraries. Yeah, there's when you log into your particular accreditation account or uh, form, there's a blue button that says I think the peer. peer so, so you can look at those those peer libraries that are used in those calculations on the accreditation application. Um, generally, that's libraries that are within 15% of your legal service area. Is how is how those are calculated. And if it's during a time when the applications are not available. To get that info, if you get it from I you. don't think that you're available. I don't think that you can log into your credit right, application the applications after turned off. that time period. But you can always email me, and I'll I will pull that data, either the data set for that's used on the accreditation application, or mm -hmm. if you want the full data from the public library survey for your peers, 
Um, you can also pull it yourself on from our website. We publish the data. So where would that be? On our website. Um, I always go to data services, and that's kind of the main page. And that data is available for download in either an Excel or a CSV format. See, now it's letting me type, isn't it? Library okay. data services. So if you scroll down a little bit, um, under library statistical data and maps. Um, and then the first link there. There's your files right there. The files, yeah, the historical data. Great. And then there's some maps down here. There's some maps and some summaries and some mm -hmm. handouts that we used or created from the data that we collected. Great. Okay. Keep going there. Uh, we have a question for Scott Schultz, who, who has joined us. For, he's the director of the Talking Book and Rail Service here at the Library Commission. So I saw him sneak in. You saw him sneak in while we were talking. We didn't stop talking to introduce him. Um, the question is, how have digital talking books changed talking book service? And I'm going to let you move up here because you've got some things to show us, too, yeah, right? I'll try to do, I'll try to do a little show and tell, which unfortunately is attached with Ford. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just going to move right out of your way. We have all these cords. Yeah, um, normally digital problem books um, have batteries, which is excellent. So this is a little demo of a prototype machine that I brought with me. Yeah, how have they changed the service? Uh, I think from a patron perspective, they're much easier to use. Uh, they sound much better. Um, and you don't have to switch between a bunch of different cassettes for this one and look, which is a huge improvement. Um, say if you were reading something like the Bible or the Joy of Cooking, uh, something that's a fairly large um, piece of, of literature, um, they were really difficult to use on cassette. Um, the Joy of Cooking was, I think, 40 something cassettes, and it was very difficult to, to remember where you were. Um, whereas with the digital machine, you can just go right to what section you want. Um, what recipe you want, um, insert a bookmark digitally so you can return to that area. Uh, they're just much more convenient. Um, and actually, I brought this machine up with me to kind of expand on how digital will continue to uh, influence um, the talking with the rail service area. Um, we've got two programs coming up um, probably over the next year that we'll start to see um, how these things will impact the service. Um, one of them is called Duplication on Demand. And what that will entail, um, we're hoping to be part of a pilot project uh, working with duplication on demand, um, hopefully in the spring of next year. Mm -hmm. And basically what that will be is instead of pulling uh, mail cards for different patrons in the morning and going to shelves and pulling books that have already been made to go take two patrons, we'll be able to actually copy books that the patron has requested or will be interested in uh, and actually make a copy of each book, potentially even bring more than one book on a cartridge if, if they would like that, and mail those out to them rather than pulling books off of the shelf. Um, that should save us um, space and organization and also get things into a more logical order for patrons. Um, there can be situations when, say, like a, a new book is very popular, we might only have eight or nine copies and they might all be out. Um, this way, if a new book becomes available, if there's 100 people that want it, they can all have it the first day it's available. So that would, I think, really um, greatly expand people's appreciation of new books in particular um, and make things quite a bit easier to use. Um, we're starting to kind of experiment with doing duplication on demand with some books that we have been created digitally, but that we don't have copies of in-house. Um, we've been doing that for it's about four months now, and it's, it's been going pretty well. Uh, we're doing maybe one or two a day at this point, uh, just uh, making sure people have you know, which, whichever book they're interested in right away in that way. Um, and the other thing that's coming up, um, they don't have an official name for this yet, but the, this uh, demo uh, prototype machine here is called the, the MOGA project, which will stand for mobile cartridge. Mm -hmm. And the idea of this is this is kind of like how uh, digital talking books meets the Kindle or something. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it will be a wireless machine and it's using uh, cellular uh, connectivity in order to grab books from a wish list that's on the, the bar site, which is mm -hmm. um, the National Library Services download site for audiobooks and, and braille materials. And let's see if this thing is working here. If there it is. Um, if you push a button here, it should say that it belongs to me. This device is registered to Scott Scholes. There are three books available. No cartridge connected. Network ready. 
Internet ready. Art is ready. Press the button to list the books on the bookshelf. So if someone sends you a blank cartridge, the idea of this machine will be that it can download books that are already on a wish list for you. And when you put a cartridge in, let's say what's on here is something that I just finished reading, and I want to get a new book. I'll pop this cartridge in and copy a new book to it. Cartridge connected. Cartridge has one book. Ooh, very hungry caterpillar. Press the button to return this book or remove the cartridge to keep it. So I'll return this book. Book returned. A carnival of animals. Press the button to skip this book or wait five seconds to copy it to the cartridge. So there's a few books waiting. Uh, let's say I don't want to read that one. Let's skip the next one. The wolf's chicken stew. Press the button to skip this book or wait five seconds to copy it to the cartridge. So I'll let it go ahead and copy this one. It will copy it very, very quickly. I'm not doing that five second wait. Moving new book to cartridge. The wolf's chicken stew. Cartridge ready. Please remove cartridge. All right. So this will be ready then for a patron to put in a player and, and listen to you right away. So the idea of this prototype is the next generation of the digital pocketbook player will incorporate technology along these lines directly into the player itself. So that there will be two devices to do it. But um, they're kind of giving some information now on how this works and, and I'm seeing troubleshooting in the field to see if it works around the country. So this is still kind of in beta. Or Very much so, yeah. yeah. This might be alpha. <laughs> But it, it does work. Uh, the functionality is there, and I can see how this would be a very powerful addition to the machine, um, where sometime in the future with digital books, we'll be able to, uh, a lot of people will be able to download a book um, directly to their machine without having to go through the, the mail system. And for those who, for whatever reason, are in a place where the wireless connectivity isn't working, we'll be able to send them books through that communication right mail system that way, too. Um, and we still have books on the shelf, so people will be able to send them. Too. So yeah, there's a lot of different ways that it's, it's helped us, I think. But, mm -hmm. um, this year actually was the official end of the cassette era. Um, it was around May and June of this year that um, the National Library Service um, told us to go ahead and return the cassette player machines that we've um, been holding on to, um, which we did over the summer. And I think we sent in a total of 573 machines um, that were officially made obsolete. So there's a few people still using them out there, but for the most part, um, we're all digital now, and, and we'll be for the. So, do we still have cassettes here at the Library Commission? Not very many. No. Just few, because yeah. there aren't very many people using them. Right. There's yeah. there's less than, I think there's only six or seven people that are back in the United States. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. And about 3,500 users, so mm -hmm. digital one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I have a question here that says, is the Big Talk from Small Libraries webinar scheduled yet for this year? Well, for next year, yeah. Yeah, for next year. <laughs> yes. That's what they mean. Um, yeah, um, and actually, if you, it should be on our calendar. Let's um, check out our calendar. That we have the calendar here at the top of the page. And it is... Always a good thing to remember, too, that we do have things on this calendar that go beyond just what the library is doing. Sure. Yeah. Yes, um, Big Talk is traditionally been the last, whatever is the last Friday in February. Mm -hmm. um, so wherever that happens to fall. Um, we figure in the middle of winter, people don't want to drive to places, so we'll do something online. Um, and yes, it's, so it will be Friday, February 23rd. Um, there's nothing more here besides the basic information and link to the main website at the moment because, um, and actually this one mentioned because I had just, it just popped up in my to-do things, uh, that this would be about the time when I open up the um, call for proposals for the ah. conference. So um, I'll be conservative and say in the next week, I was going to say by the end of this week, but I don't want to get myself in a hole with that, <laughs> within the next week. <laughs> Um, there's not, yeah, um, there'll be an announcement asking for the call for proposals. So for libraries out there, if, you're, if you've got something you want to present about Big Talk from Small Libraries, this is our little libraries, uh, FT or population surge of 10,000 or less of any type of library, school, academic, public. Um, but we want to hear from you what you're doing and just what you want to hear from too. So there will be an announcement, I'll send messages out, and then there will be on the website for it a um, link to submit your proposal um, that will be added like within the next week or so. And um, So we'd like to have some small libraries in Nebraska make oh, some proposals. Oh, you usually do, yeah. Um, but this is also, if you look at the previous conferences on here, um, we have libraries from all over the country. 
that um, participate in both um, presenting and attending. Um, this is a map of last year. People logged in from all across the United States and Canada. This was attendees. Um, but if we look at our previous conferences here, we've got all the previous ones listed going back to the beginning, which the first year was 2012. And those are archived, right? People can. Oh yeah, to that's what this is. Yep, we have all of our um, mm -hmm. presentation under the under each one under presentations. You will have links to um, the recording of that particular session. Um, and if they did have slides or PowerPoints, we have those as well. So you can watch all of the previous years worth on here. Yeah. And here was our first first one. It was Nebraska Library. That was just totally happy. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. So yes, it's coming. It says they're joining us February 23rd, 2018. So look for more info coming very, very soon. Excellent. So how many libraries are part of the Overdrive group and what's required if I want to join? Um, we uh, just added three libraries uh, this fall, so we are at 173. That's um, fantastic. Yeah. Um, to, to join, we would need to be a uh, really established library. We would uh, talk to uh, me to let me uh, know you're interested. Um, and, a couple of forms to fill out, and then we would go about talking about getting you set up for um, uh, authentication. And uh, how much do they have to pay? Is it there? Uh, for small libraries, and I think I think all of the libraries that are public libraries that are eligible um, at this point, I think everyone would pay that minimum fee of five hundred dollars. So. And is there, okay, here we are. We've got the overdrive site up. So, you know, this is the main Nebraska site. overdrive yeah. site. That's where we wanted to go. Um, and that is the actual uh, digital collection site. So, I think the first page you were on is overdrive uh, libraries group. how to participate. And mm -hmm. so, if you scroll down, there'd be uh, instructions. Great. Um, and that's more information for once you've joined. Um, that is the pricing and details. Uh, Pretty much, yeah, pretty much, you know, we don't have uh, as many new libraries joining now because we've really gotten a lot of uh, 173. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of libraries that um, it's feasible for to participate um, do participate. So um, now, you know, it's it's more a matter of you know, a library contacts us and we work directly with them and well, send them send them the paperwork. And this is any type of library? Um, just or is it just public? Yeah, yeah, it's a requirement. It's kind of overdrive. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I, I wanted to mention that if anybody in the audience has a question, now would be a good time to get that typed into the chat box. Yes. We did start a little late, as you guys noticed. We were getting things set up here, so um, we'll go as long as it takes. Um, if you do guys have questions, type it into the question section. We'll get them asked. If you do have to leave before your question gets asked, that's okay. Um, we'll answer it anyways, and then you can come back and hear it on the recording and see what we answer. Um, we'll go to at least, um, since we started late, I'd say at least 11.15 at a minimum for getting to the questions we have here, and longer depending on what comes in. Yes, Just as a heads up and for all of you guys wondering if we're going to be wrapping up soon. So I need help finding books in other languages for my students. So what's the best way to do that? What does the library commission do for a teacher uh, that comes to a school librarian and says, I need some books in other languages? Probably the best bet is to go to uh, the Nebraska Access Databases. Let's do that. And then go down on the left side there, you should see Laurel's cat. Oh, there it is. Yep. Yeah. And that will let you uh, search for a title of a book that you're looking for and limit it by a language. And so, you know, as long as a library that catalogs uh, their books and since they're holding some yeah. CLC, um, has, assuming the book is available in that language or that. It's owned by uh, some libraries that are represented in the world cat. You should be able to track it down and request it through um, interlibrary loan. 
And it, it, it is going to vary depending on the language and the popularity of the book. But that's certainly, that's the first thing I would do. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, and actually, the teacher could do that themselves. The library could show them now. The teacher mm -hmm. could have at it, and they could do it in their library loan request. Um, so I'm kind of trying to get through these. Um, how can we get a website for our library? Um, that's something that uh, Craig in our department has been uh, taking care of for the last couple of years, and he's uh, leaving us shortly. Um, but we are still going on and offering the uh, WordPress uh, library websites. Um, Alana, and we host those. So you, those you don't, if you get your WordPress site, you don't have to host it. We and Alana it. Novotny is getting some uh, last minute uh, tips and instructions from Craig, so she's going to kind of tie this over while we're looking for a replacement. So, um, there it is. So, the, yeah, Nebraska Library's on the web. Um, so. There's a page that talks about how you can participate. What's so the cost? There's no cost. But there is time involved. Yes, you will have, have to course. set up and maintain right. and post regularly. So that's that would be the first stop, I guess. And then the next stop might be to contact the land in the body. And Deborah, who's the head of our department, would be a good person to talk to initially to um, I know Elaine is uh, sort of trying to learn some of the technical details in case anyone gets us stuck or has any uh, problems. Of course, we are between uh, librarians responsible for that. So I have another question about statistical reports. This one says, how, how do you use the this, this statistics? And how can the libraries use them? Well, we talked we talked earlier about peer comparisons. Mm -hmm. I think that's one thing that we use on our end for the accreditation process. But also something that can be helpful to libraries um, when they look at their data and compare it to their peers. Um, that can be very helpful for librarians and decision makers on a local level. Um, but also, if a library has, has Submitted their statistics over a certain period of time, they can compare themselves to themselves right. and say, well, oh, well point. how have our programs changed over the years and how has our attendance changed over the years? And maybe it's time to try something new, or um, maybe that's evidence of, of some successes that they've had. Um, so that's, I think, a couple of ways that, that they can be used. Um, on a statewide level, we use them, a rod. Talk about you know, some of the budget process. I mean, we use those statistics you know, for those purposes. We are required to report them to IMLS too um, every year, so that's one of the reasons um, we do collect them. Very good. One more question here. Have you got any on the chat box? Um, no, not yet. Okay, the last question we have is Does Nebraska access? Help school libraries meet Rule 10 requirements. Uh, yes, it does. <laughs> so we probably want Nebraska access back up again, right, to help show that. Um, it will meet the requirements for uh, number of magazines and journals that you have access to, and then it meets the requirement. If you see there's a in the lower left corner that's Funk and Lag Balls, um, it does uh, provide an up to date encyclopedia, which is a measure. So those two, uh, those are the ones that everyone asks about. It. Those two requirements are met by Nebraska Access. And so those are two things that if a school library is struggling with budget issues, they don't have to do because we're offering that for them. Right, right. Excellent. Well, those are the questions that I got in advance. Like I said, I got them at the uh, conference, the NLA and SLA conference. Uh, we got them at the booth, people, we had them at sitting out, people put them in the, in the box, and there we were. We, we answered them at the conference session, and we're answering them again today here because we feel like this really extends the conference session on into the fall now.
So um, if there are no other questions, is there anything anybody on the panel would like to share for the good of the group? What's going on with the commission that we need to talk about? <laughs> I guess if you're curious about the commission at any time, please take a look at our website. That's always a, a good place to get up-to-date information, as well as information about other libraries across the state. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Krista, for running the show for us. I'll get back to the right scene to get get my questions up. There we go. Okay. Nobody has anything else? No? Everyone's still here, so that's good. Thank you. Thanks <laughs> for staying with us. Um, all right. So thank you, everyone, for being here. We have recorded today, so um, this will be available on our website, um, potentially later this afternoon, possibly tomorrow. Um, and I'll bring up that right now. Our Encompass Live website here. So this is our, our main page and our recordings, these are our upcoming shows. And um, our archives, there's a link right underneath all the upcoming shows that you can get to um, the archives from. And this is where we post our most recent ones. This is last week's show. We will have um, the recording, which will be on our YouTube account. Um, there isn't a presentation for this one, as you saw, it's just our website, so just so the recording will be here. Um, when it is done and available, I will um, email everyone who attended and post it out on um, all of our various communication uh, venues. So, that will wrap up today's show. Um, I hope to join us next week. We just said this this morning, and hopefully you can explain. Um, no, no. Amanda's, yeah. Um, Non-visual desktop access to the Good Love. This is a session that one of our staff, um, Amanda Sweet, did at our MLI conference. That's right. And um, she had offered, and I wanted to definitely have it on, so I don't know what I did. Just yeah, this. this is really awesome. Um, some of you may have participated in the VTOP program a few years back, uh, which I believe is through JAWS, or has a non-visual way to, to use computers. Um, over time, you know, JAWS can become sort of complicated and expensive to maintain. And this is a, an alternative that's very close to free um, for keeping track of, of keeping a, a screen reading non visual desktop um, going in your library. Mm -hmm. um, so Amanda's gone through the process of how to set it up, um, how NDBA works. Uh, she's going to demonstrate a little bit with our website. Mm -hmm. And I believe she's going to talk a little bit um, also about how to make sure your website um, is set up to function properly with screen readers. Right, yeah. This description is what I pulled just this morning off of this. Um, conference website, but she's oh, tweeted right. a little bit um, yeah. to specify about that. Yeah, but we can talk about that. That there's a lot of people she discovered at conference were asking, well, this is great, but what could I have done already to have right. my website better prepared for the screen readers that people do have both this and other right. kinds. Yeah. Sounds, Sounds like a great show. As well. yeah. yeah. So definitely sign up for that next week. Like I said I just added it before I came down here this morning to do the show. Um, so that will be next week. And you can see all of our other sessions here um, uh, through November and December um, that are added. Um, and more will be added as we go. This is an ongoing thing, yeah, obviously an ongoing thing. And um, we'll start getting our 2018 dates under here. And um, I've got a note to myself too. Um, 2018, and I don't know if I'm going to do something, it's actually the 10th year of Encompass Live. We better have a birthday cake. A little. Wow. So, yes. <laughs> and we'll, we won't talk about how long I've been here or whatever that all means about anything beyond that. But um, so definitely do sign up for that and any of our other upcoming shows. Also, Encompass Live is on Facebook. So if you're a big Facebook user, give us a like over there. We do give. Um, uh, what would I do? <laughs> back. Um, notices like here's a reminder about to log in today's show when the recordings are ready. I post on here. Um, it's not posted. I'm not logged in. Um, so if you are big on Facebook, give a like, and you'll see a couple times a week um, messages from us coming up on your Facebook feed. So other than that, um, thanks everyone. Thank you everybody for thank you, Kristen. Bye bye. Bye. We'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye bye.